Hello, and welcome to Surveyor Says, the podcast from the National Society of Professional Surveyors. Each week, we bring you fascinating guests that are involved in the profession of surveying. We cover a lot of ground, including Table Lay Talk with Gary Kent, Point of Order with the NSPS Joint Government Affairs Team, Future Focus, highlighting current and future leaders of the profession, and everything survey-related in between. Thanks for joining us here on the podcast, and hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of Surveyor Says. Joining Executive Director Kurt Sumner this week is Joey Wilson, President of Wilson & Associates, a surveying, engineering, and environmental firm from Franklin, Tennessee. Really, Joey, it's, it's very impressive to me to see from the information that, that I found about the company uh, the the range that you guys cover. I mean, you for all all intents and purposes, you got the whole southeastern United States. <laughs> we we, uh, we do. We try to stay within our area of expertise and a decent footprint. And um, traditionally, we were uh, 100% rooted in construction market. But over the last seven eight years, we've uh, we've started doing more. Uh, a lot of regional work. Nashville has exploded off the market, so our residential sites. Um, doubled our revenue and, and kept us, uh, you know, even a stronger regional presence. Um, and we, you know, we, we work in the commercial, industrial, and heavy highway markets as well. And so uh, typically you have to go where the work is in the, in the highway and commercial sectors. And we've been blessed to have enough uh, uh, residential work here in Middleton and to really fill our coffers beyond capacity. And it looks like from the, from the licensure side, you're pretty well balanced between surveying and engineering. We are, we are. We've got uh, several of us are dual licensed, and uh, we've got several that are PEs and several that are RLSs. And, you know, we're we're actively looking for more right now, but they're kind of like finding a five leaf clover in the middle of a field full of clovers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. I can certainly understand that. I think one of the things that that really impressed me and and gave me incentive to want to talk with you is the fact that. One of your employees actually contacted me about you and about the company. And to me, that says everything. Um, well, because I, I that's, what we that. all, that's what we all strive for, right? We, we want to have successful companies and we want to have happy people and, and make them feel part of the team. And, and I certainly got that impression uh, from David. Yeah, and David's a phenomenal individual and he came to us. Uh, primarily because of our company culture. And so I'll, I'll rewind a little bit and share a little bit of our bad story, but we, uh, we had enough uh, volume of work to survive the 2008 recession and, and get into 2011. And that's kind of when our, our recession hit. And we couldn't buy a job that year if I paid cash for it and offered to do it for free. And so that was when uh, I think I, I'd been to another client's corporate meeting and they had a, a corporate chaplain there and I, I was struck. I didn't think you could, you know, you could do that in companies and come to find out, well, that's perfectly legal. And so we hired our corporate chaplain of that year. At the same time, I, I remember having a conversation with a missionary friend of mine that we did some work with in Biloxi for four or five years after Hurricane Katrina. And I just told him the stresses of trying to run a company, you know, we, we can't throw enough ballast overboard and cut enough salaries. And we, we've been blessed to have enough work at that up to that point. But it looked like going into the next year, we weren't going to obtain anything. And so, you know, he um, he kind of inspired myself, my father, my younger brother, to, to, you know, to really invest in our, our faith within the company. And, and that's when I basically, I was at my church, and a sermon, uh, a pastor gave a sermon about uh, um, another pastor that was a head, head of a mega church, and he couldn't handle the pressures and stresses, and God spoke to him and said, you're no longer the head pastor I am, and I'll take care of the rest of that. And so that's when we just kind of put everything in God's hands to get us through what we needed and, and stop worrying about what we didn't get. And, and, and as it turns out, the jobs that we didn't get were the blessings in disguise. And we got everything we needed when we needed it. We didn't get everything we wanted when we wanted it. And so we've, we've been guiding our company since then with those faith principles. I, I don't know if you, you saw our mission vision statement, but you know, our current mission um, has evolved over the last 10 years and now it's just basically we're here to serve and, and we're a service company and sometimes we serve our own detriment um, but we are here to serve and 
it's in a specific order of God, our creator, each other, our clients, our community, and our clients in our community. And so we've really embraced that in understanding that everything we have has been a gift from God and we need to be good stewards of it. We want to make a workplace appreciated and cared for and can thrive. And so we have just embarked on a, you know, fast forward to now, uh, my COO and I are embarking on a cultural tour to really emphasize our, our mission, vision, and core values. And what we hold paramount is our culture over everything. Talent is a close second, but culture will always out trump talent. And so we've been slowly over the last 10 years weeding out bad cultural actors and replacing them with good cultural fits. And so it's, it's proved um, uh, extremely well for us. We, you know, we, we have been able to shed some light into our clients in kind of their spaces and tell them a little bit about our story and, and help them get through some of those issues that, uh, that plague them. And it, it, it's a different level of partnership when you, you not only are a preferred vendor, um, but you, you, you're sought out for, um, you know, general business advice, cultural advice. How, how do we run different aspects of our, of our company compared to how they run that? And so we become more than just a provider. We've become trusted uh, business partners as well. That's an amazing story. And, so. and you're certainly talking to the right person in that vein of where your company, uh, is and where it has been, where it's going. Uh, I grew up the son of a Baptist minister. Um, okay. So right. ev everything you were just <laughs> talking about hit home really close with me. Um, because. Yeah, yeah well. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say we all have to have a place to work. Um, we just want to have an exceptional place to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that that's quite exceptional, I think. I, I I can't say that it's not commonplace because I, I don't hear that kind of uh, testimony, if you will, from other people, then they may be very well doing the same thing. But my sense is that it's maybe not unique, but perhaps unusual in a good way. It is, it is. We, um, myself, my younger brother, and uh, my COO and CPO are, um, there, we're also members of a peer advisory group called C12, and it's Christian-based board of directors. And, and the vision is, is that you're, you're, you know, there's going to be more people come to faith in the work environment than the church environment, and your your work, the people you touch there, is a bigger mission field than, than those that will be touched by the church. Because there's lots of people struggling and uh, lots of issues, especially when you get in the construction sector, and uh, a lot of baggage that people carry around, and they just, you know, they, we can provide. Uh, opportunities and, and things for them to, to realize they don't have to do it alone. And so knowing that, that takes a lot of the stress out of life and a lot of the stress out of uh, just the daily, the daily grind. And so it's been, it's been a blessing that we're all aligned uh, in that vein. And it's really been the driving force behind our company and where we're going and what we can do and, and um, you know, what we've got plans for, for the future. Have you had the opportunity to, expand and maybe I didn't understand everything you were saying or comprehend, but one of the questions that came to mind as you were talking was, have you been able to, to spread that, so to speak, beyond within the company or within your, your uh, group of people that you work with to other entities or other folks in the business or. Uh, we have, um, we've got uh, trusted uh, uh, companies that we partner with. Uh, some have joined C12, some, they can't because the corporate guidelines won't pay for it. It is the monthly fee and it is a for-profit organization. But uh, the, the C12 group that we are members of is is 50% is business, 50% ministry and how to augment the two. And so there's there's practical business segments in there. Um, but there's also, you know, how to, how to promote Christianity in your faith within your business. And so it's not mandatory that people in our company be Christians. They just know our set of values. And uh, I've got other peers that have, you know, uh, professed atheists that work within their company, but they love the culture. <laughs> and so um, it, it's, it's astounding to see the impact. Um, we as business owners, you see it more in the South, but C12 is a nationwide organization. And it's just really helped us kind of develop um, our, our you know, guiding morals for our company, but also given us lots of practical business insights and the, you know, things from recruiting to HR to, 
growth to even, you know, how do you, how do you give back to your employees and things of that nature? So it's been a, been a, been a huge benefit for us. Yeah, it's a, it's a kind of strategy that I won't say it, it's, it doesn't make it impossible to fail, of course, but I think it's a strategy that tends to draw people together better um, mm -hmm. because they, they have a vested interest. They have a, a group of people they know they can depend on, so to speak. Uh, so I, that's very laudable. Um, I'd be interested to learn more about the whole the whole C12 um, sure. entity. That that would be interesting. Sure, yeah. About. We'll, we'll we'll call me call me anytime and we'll uh, we'll sit down and go and have a deep dive into it. <laughs> yeah, you, you you called me. I've gotten off on a tangent. You've called me to talk more or less about uh, um, uh, the business of surveying. I, I reckon. <laughs> well, uh, I actually called you to talk to you. So um, obviously the business is part of that, but sharing what you shared uh, about the, the C12 and the, the culture within the company, I think is uh, every bit as important as anything about the actual work itself, um, because culture has a big, a big role to play in anything that you're doing. And when you have one where people are working in unity and have common goals, uh, it has to make business be better. It just has to. It does. And you'd be surprised <clears throat> um, how many people out there are Christian business leaders or how many people before they get in a man basket and are hoisted 200 feet in the air would like to be prayed over. <laughs> so it <laughs> yeah. does. Uh, it, <laughs> it, is, it does allow some connectivity. and. Um, you know, it's not, we're not sitting on the corner thumping our Bibles. It's just, it's a, it's an organic thing that we talk about. We try to be open about who we are, what we're doing, um, you know, about our faith, but it does drive culture. And so at the end of the day, we want everybody in our company to want to understand that they're, they're loved. They're loved by God. They've got, you know, the best is yet to be. Um, they've got great opportunities, especially here. Um, they've got people in this company that care for them and are, are you know, intently interested in their success and how can they get there um, are intently interested in their their personal life if there's things that are in their life that we can help with we, we want to know about it and it doesn't all flow to me we've 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 had corporate chaplains we've had in-house corporate chaplains and we've had out uh, outsourced corporate chaplains we have you know strong leaders and so um we can connect you with with help or things financial or, or, or physical resources that you need um and it just it, it it, it it's not you know that's who we are that's not what we do because we own a, you know it's kind of hard to coin that that's who we are and that comes out in what we do as a business and so you know for my last 10 years it's been a cultural push knowing you know coming up in the construction market knowing how uh, i guess vicious that can be there's a lot of you know foul language rough uh rough people and and just you know people that are generally upset and so changing the culture of our company and our approach to how those people react we we can't control them but we can control how we react and we've seen you know great benefits and, and relief of stress in our people knowing that they can say no to people like that knowing that they can breathe fresh air into their lives knowing that we're you know we're trying to do what's best for them ultimately at the end of the day um and so culture drives everything for us um we, we do want technically minded strong skill set people uh, but they've got to be a good cultural fit and so so far that's all worked um that, that's all starting to really click now here in the last two or three years we've grown from 30 people five years ago to 75 people this summer and onboarding that many new people it gets really hard really quick because they don't truly understand the culture and you know there's we're in a very um you know very demanding uh market that that you can't find help in and and um there's, there's too much work for everybody to do. And so we're having to remind people that, especially younger people that have come to us that are new, that there'll be bad times. And so all we can control is how we react in these times. There's going to be good, there's going to be bad, but we need to be thankful for the busyness that we have. We need to lift each other up. We don't need to be punitive if somebody causes you to stumble within the company or with or outside the company. And we don't need to complain about our clients if they're if they're causing issues, we need to understand what their issues are, where those issues are coming from, 
how we can help them with those issues and maybe come up with some synergies that, that help us both. Cause it's, it's kind of like taking that thorn out of the tiger's foot and realizing he's not out to kill you. He's just got a thorn in his foot. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> that's a good analogy, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's pretty good. 75. Wow. That, that's pretty good growth. That's good growth. We've been working on, we've been going through another process too. And a, and a lot of small companies, you know, uh, probably don't see that a lot of big companies don't see this. And, and this is all part of our, our leadership's interaction within C12, but we started a book and a process called uh, the EOS system, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial operating system. And it's come, it's derived from the book traction. But um, it's probably going to take us 18 months to 24 months to get through it. We're we're in, we're finishing our last quarter of the process, so we're almost a year into it now, and um, we're basically getting our accountability chart started. That's everything's got to flow from there. A lot of companies, it's just we do anything and everything, and we we hire bodies and put them in the seats that we think they need to go in. And so we've been really focusing on finding out what our processes are, what positions we need. And then hiring people to fill those positions, not the other way around. So we've we've spent a great deal of time getting that up to speed. We've developed our leadership teams. We've developed our our subgroups of our GMs and our project managers. We really started to add structure to a company that's you know a lot of companies start that start out in the you know regional survey marketer. They don't have kind of the corporate structure. Something happens to the owner, then the rest of the business disappears, and so. We're setting something up that uh, that'll protect the, the employees as well as the clients, and so um, excuse me, there we go. And so, going through this, you know, we're documenting processes, we're training, we're onboarding new people, we're doing cultural meetings, um, a vast multitude of things that that you see that Fortune 500 companies have, and have taken years to develop those processes. So, we're going through. A year and a half to two years of growing pains and there'll still be things to document but um that way when we onboard new people we've got everything we we schedule all of our work through a, a software called zoho and it gives us you know some resource of information where we can store all our training manuals all of our processes all of our default template seed files all of our technical data but we also spend a lot of time scheduling and you've probably heard of the C, the word cpm schedule over your over your your career critical path method and uh or gantt charts and this allows us to deliver stuff to our clients when we say we're going to deliver it to them <laughs> and not yeah we'll we'll, uh, we'll get that done in three weeks or three months or whenever and then just kind of have everything in one pile with that organization so it's really um, this process has really given us uh intentionality direction organization and and calm some of those brush fires that lead to stress Everything when you've got a four alarm fire for something due in two weeks that you didn't know was coming, that leads to uh, stress in the system. And so we're trying to alleviate that with with diligent, diligent, diligent planning. In the in the market today, are you finding find it difficult to find not only find the people that you want to have, but just people in general? I hear varying uh, reports on that from different people. It is. It is. We've we've hired. We've probably hired five and turned over three this year that have left for various unexplainable reasons, and and we've had some that have had to go due to cultural issues and performance things. And so we've been lucky. We've onboarded. We onboarded 24 people between May of last year, May of this year, and so that was a big uh, a, a big one time <laughs> addition. And so. We're having we're having good luck finding, um, especially in the boundary survey market. We're having good luck finding those people. The the unicorns are those that really know road construction, bridge construction surveying. It's a little different animal that that takes. In the past, we've always trained those people from from birth, and so they're fewer and far between to find. And then what we're also having difficulty finding are good technicians, good. Um, even experienced RLSs or PEs. Uh, we can find more PEs than we can find uh, registered land surveyors. Uh, we've had, uh, we've used LinkedIn, not LinkedIn, Indeed mm -hmm. a lot. That's where we've found most of our, our people. Um, but we have had uh, some um, uh, staffing agencies out looking, I've had one company looking for three months and I think we just got a hit today on a survey party chief and so, 
it's challenging. We we could double, triple revenue, but um, you know, we're having to tell our clients we just can't get to certain projects, and they'll have to find a vendor that uh, they can get to them. And you know, it's really important for us to hit deadlines. So um, just due to resources, we've had to turn down some things, and it, it hurts, but it's it pays dividends for everybody in the end. Nobody, we don't run our resources in the ground, and they don't get upset because we can't hit the deadlines that, that they need. Yeah, that's a good strategy. I we don't do a ton of hiring around here, of course, because we have a small office. But in the last year or so, our the person that was our accounting manager retired, and um, mm-hmm. we looked at a couple of different uh, outlets to try to find folks, and we found that using Indeed actually worked better for us than any any of the others. Uh, and pretty quick, it does. very very capable and somebody that fits in our culture. It does, um, and and we 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 have decided we we could reach a certain level of talent with Indeed, and going beyond that, we've had to use um, staffing agencies. And so, it just right now it's it's a good problem to have. It is what it is. Um, you know, we're always looking for good talent and trying to build a resource base, but um, they're they're getting hard to find. <laughs> Now you guys do a fairly wide variety of, of things. I know you do highway and commercial and industrial. Is is that the the basic? You sounds like you might not get too involved in. I, I'm sure you probably do subdivisions and stuff like that. But just a private citizen kind of thing. Maybe are you guys involved in yeah. that? Yeah. So we really changed our focus this year, and we changed our vision statement. And, and basically, it reads to be the preferred preferred geomatics provider to our identified clientele. And we thought that was really important that we focus on that because we used to do, you know, coming out of the recession, we felt like we lived through the the Great Depression, right? So anything and everything, if you need the trash taken out, we'll do it. We'll wash cars. We'll survey your life. (laughs) Um, Even though we had a pretty good basis of work in uh, in the transportation sector. And so as in the last five years, we've cleaved off things that detract us from what we do well. And so we don't do design work anymore. We don't do one-off projects. We don't do any um, B2C uh, business to consumer. We're all B2B business to business. And so we've really focused on a few main areas. One, our transportation market, which we've developed some new products for uh, the Department of Transportation, the Tennessee Department of Transportation. The term is called VDC now, Visual Design Construction, but we started this seven, eight years ago. We just called it an in-depth constructability review. And taking the lessons learned from the transportation side, we created a, we brought like, uh, you're probably familiar with uh, the word, the acronym BIM, Building Information Modeling. Yes, yes. We brought that to the, to the, to the highway sector in which we modeled the roadway, all the utilities, everything that we knew that could have a conflict. The only thing we couldn't model were, were existing utilities. And just did a quick, uh, not only a, a, you know, kind of a clash detection analysis, but we also have um, two retired VPs of construction with Rogers Group and, and Bell and Associates. Once we got this modeled up, then we could look at it from the totality of can it be built? How many different pieces does it have? Do we have four different types of retaining walls uh, on the same project? Let's get, let's, you know, let's change that to one type. You can get one contractor, make sure it's not a specialty contractor that's out of the country. Do we have certain you know, capabilities for um, uh, types of conduit, types of electrical services. Do we want to cross the road one time in one uh, planned trench? We, you know, eliminate, you know, crossing the road 10 or 15 times. When we lay things that are extra depth, we analyze the slopes and the layback. Is that going to take out any already built structures? This type of approach is being used in private sector now. We're doing some work on Facebook site here in Nashville in a, in a uh, major league soccer stadium in which both contractors use the process it's called VDC and all this is modeled up beforehand to make sure that we don't you know any any safety trenches don't take out utilities that were built in phase one or the prior phases of the contract so um so that's kind of the what we are in the uh in the uh, transportation sector the industrial sector we've done some plant work uh, one project in particular is a two and a half billion dollar plant from the ground up in, in Charleston, Tennessee, it's known as Vacher poly, Polysilicon. They make semiconductor, or they make polysilicon for semiconductor chips. But that's when we first got into LIDAR. I knew in the middle of the recession, we needed to figure it out. It was a great 
uh, it was going to be a game changer. And it was one of those things that if it didn't work, you couldn't take it back and trade it in for a Ford truck. So <laughs> we were going to invest $150,000 at the time and, and, uh, and, and go to work. And sure enough, this, this one project, we couldn't have done it without it. And, and we learned a lot in that, in that sector, a lot for, for BIM work and a lot for, um, what we call dimensional analysis in which we as built hundreds of thousands of anchor bolts and embeds and buildings and did steel to concrete interface dimensional analysis stuff that can't be done with normal surveying techniques. And so that, that commercial uh, industrial sector uh, helped us skip over into the aerial sector. And so now we're into the residential market. And so when we get a commercial client that wants to do a, a development, the first thing they order is an Alta survey and, and then quickly a topographic survey. And we've coined this division, the BAT division, the Boundary Alpha Topo. And so before we uh, set foot on the ground now, we fly everything. We have two aerial lot of our units. Uh, there are two Regal mini buxes. And so even a bigger investment, $250,000 per bird. Um, but the, the cost of not owning those would be extinction. Um, and so anytime we do a BAT survey now, we fly it, we put in ground control that um, it's, it's a PPK method and it's perpetuated through the project and it's much more accurate than the traditional ways of surveying. And we can extract once we fly it 75% of the data we need from the LIDAR data. We get all of our uh, above ground utilities, buildings, power poles, power lines, curbs, all that stuff. And it's survey grade. So we're getting top and toe of curb and we can do it virtually. So the field crew time is reduced from three months to three weeks. And then we send the boots on the ground to get the, the things that you have to, the monuments, the corners, the inverts, and those things. And so speed to market's been our key and our key to success in the residential side, but it's also been leveraging the technology, paying attention to what's out there. And then identifying within our residential clients some unique uh, opportunities to help them uh, speed up their processes through the use of the LIDAR and mapping and things of that nature. And so we've seen a great deal of success and growth. And so our 10 year growth plan is going to be more aimed towards the residential services sector. And uh, we think we've got just great opportunities, great, uh, um, uh, uh, I guess, um, synergies with our builders and, and our, 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 you know, our next, uh, <laughs> our next venture is into uh, some subterranean tunnel mapping. So that's kind of the spaces we work in. And, um, We've always had a unique ability to get into a space, identify some potential problems, come up with solutions that typically the owner didn't know they even had the problem to begin with. And then that, that basically is vertically integrated. They, they save money. We almost pay for our services. So it makes sense to keep hiring us. So we don't really advertise a lot. We just, most of our, most of our, our work is from where our name's been passed around. And people understand our you know, our speed to market, our work ethic, and our integrity, and that just that's been driving our our revenue and our our um, market share for the last ten years. Now, well, it appears to me from our conversation today that anybody who listens to this podcast will learn some good lessons in terms of attitude, uh, the the ability or the willingness to seek out new opportunities and find ways to leverage if you will you know what you're doing already and you know that whole forward thinking initiative uh, all those things that come into play and some and i'm sure this is not foreign to you of course but sometimes when you get running the business you you get all caught up rather than thinking how do i make this better um so i appreciate everything you've shared today because I, I think it'll be helpful to our listeners to think wow that that sounds like a really good strategy to, to move forward and of course some people say well I can't afford to do that and but maybe the answer is I can't afford not to you definitely can't afford not to when we got in the light our business um, my, my my biggest thought is that we can't afford not to we can't afford to be left behind same thing when we got the GPS if we kept doing things the way that we've done them for 30 years, we would be obsolete. And so it is, um, it's a tough pill to swallow, but if you've got the willingness and the, uh, the desire that you can make it work and you have to. Um, and so you, you've got to always be thinking about what's going to change because technology is going to wipe us out even quicker than it, than it was 10 or 15 years ago. And so what I tell my team, the only constant we can expect out of life is change. And if you don't want to adapt to it, you're not going to survive very long. That's for sure. 
Well, having this conversation makes it very clear to me um, why David gave me a call and suggested that we have this conversation. Um, it's been, <laughs> been, been great to, to have you with me. And um, I can see that inspiration just in when I was talking to, to him, you could hear the enthusiasm in his voice. And it's just a great thing to see and hear uh, when you have a culture that allows that kind of thing to happen because people begin to believe in the process, believe in the leaders, believe that it'll actually work and that they can be a part of it. Yes, yes, we've been very blessed with what we have and we just want to be good stewards with it and make sure our people are well taken care of and our clients as well. Like I said, to begin, at the beginning, we, we're here to serve and sometimes we act our own detriment, but we're, we'll jump in with both feet to help somebody out. That is so true. Well, I won't keep you all day. I do appreciate you being with me, though, and, and I've actually learned a lot of things talking to you today, so I can't always say that when I do these podcasts, but I do very much appreciate you being with me, and and uh, and hopefully we'll have a chance to meet somewhere down the line. Sure, Tim. I appreciate the time today. Uh, where, where are you located, by the way? Our office actually is in Frederick, Maryland, uh, okay. which is just right. northwest of Washington, D.C., uh, I'm in the okay. process of phasing out of here as the executive director, and I'll still be hanging on in an emeritus position, but I'm in the process of building a, a house where I grew up in southwestern Virginia. Um, about What part about, of southwestern Virginia? Um, Carroll County, which is um, about 60 miles north of Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and about 100 miles east of Bristol. And about okay, 60 so, miles southwest of Roanoke. So. Okay, I, my my family and I, I live in Glade Spring, Virginia, which is a oh, little yeah, bit into. Oh yeah, Spring. Um, okay, that's where my my grandfather moved to when he semi-retired. They lived in Hayside, Virginia, when he was working the coal mines, and um, he uh, he left Clinchfield, opened up his own coal mining operation to mine out what they didn't mine out and so my uh, aunts and uncles my mother's side of the family is from there my my uncles had an engineering company in Abingdon for a number of years and they did environmental permitting for the mine industry up there so it's beautiful southwest virginia is a beautiful area um, spent many summers up there in august with the windows open and no air conditioning because uh, we're at 2500 feet and yeah. we're, we're perfectly fine <laughs> yeah that's a great place to be and and actually, I've actually done work in all of those places you just mentioned when I, I was in Blacksburg for several years after school with a company there. And okay. we worked the whole southwestern Virginia from, well, all over, but primarily from Roanoke West uh, and served, served a lot of those little towns and counties out that way. Well, you definitely earned your medal if you did survey work in that area because it's as steep <laughs> as a cow's face any way you go. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. For sure. Well, thanks again for joining Whatever me today. I really appreciate it, and hopefully, we'll run into each other down the road. You've been listening to the Surveyor Says podcast, brought to you by the National Society of Professional Surveyors. If you have any questions about today's episode or any other topic, please email us at info at nsps.us.com, and we are here to help. Visit our website, nsps.us.com, to learn more about our association, the programs we administer and support, our sustaining members, and information about future episodes of Surveyor Says. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spotify, as well as our podcast host, Podbean. And remember, it's a great day to be a surveyor. Surveyor.